Hi, everybody. So as you can tell, I am not outside preaching to the congregation. We had some technical issues and the recording did not go through. Uh, we did stream the video and we thought it was streaming to our YouTube channel, but as it turned out, it was just kind of disappearing into the ether and we sorted that out. We shouldn't have a problem next week. But in addition to that, my iPad overheated during the service and we were using that to record the audio. So we also didn't get that. So I'm here in my office uh, recording a take two of the message this morning so that we have it for our records and so that you can hear it on the podcast channel. So what we did this morning, we were talking about the book of James, and we're beginning a series on James and the church. And we're looking at the first 15 verses of the book of James, but I want to give you a little bit of background, and we'll put a link for the bulletin, which had a handout with background information on it. We'll put that in the, the YouTube information so that you have it. James is a, 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 small, go- a small epistle. It's not substantial. It's, it's just a couple of chapters. and comes right after the book of Hebrews, and a lot of people know it as basically the, the Proverbs of the New Testament. Uh, there's a passage that deals with the tongue, which comes up quite often in people's relationships, and so um, there is this sense that, okay, this is what James is about. James is about um, controlling your tongue. It's about wisdom. It's a, and it is a part, a part of James is those things, but that's not all that James is. And James is a letter written to the churches, and, and we often forget that epistles are not written to individuals. They are written to churches. They were meant to be uh, distributed to the churches so that people could um, read it, understand it, pass it along, and it would guide their behavior. And so when we look at the book of James, we are looking at a message from James, who was a leader in the church of Jerusalem, to uh, the church. And James is an, one of the earliest books of the New Testament, if not the earliest book of the New Testament. And it was probably written shortly after the church that was centered in Jerusalem was spread out by Jewish persecution. So after uh, the death of Stephen, there is a, a persecution, and Saul of Tarsus is a part of it, and the Jews spread out. They go out into Samaria, they go into Syria. Um, they really kind of move all over the place to... Um, they, they follow the Great Commission. They go out of Judah out of Judea, out of Jerusalem, into uh, the world, ultimately into the uttermost parts of the world. So at the time, the church is mostly uh, Jews. And so James, who is also a Jew, um, is writing to them in terms that Jews would understand, that maybe Gentiles would not have been as familiar with. uh, And and he's dealing with a, a wisdom structure when he writes his epistle, something that would have been familiar to those who sat in synagogue all their lives. Now, James is uh, the brother of Jesus. He's the half-brother of Jesus. He's the son of Mary and Joseph, and he appears in the Gospels. Uh, He also appears in the book of Acts uh, after the the killing of the apostle James, uh, who is the brother of John. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, uh, steps into the church of Jerusalem and apparently takes uh, quite a significant leadership role, and he's there a lot, and Paul mentions him in the book of Galatians as being a leader in the church of Jerusalem. So this is a situation where this is a a man who uh, grew up with Jesus. Uh, He's the brother of Jesus. Uh, He is, however, originally he rejected Jesus. He didn't follow Jesus, and then after the resurrection, at some point, he becomes a follower of Jesus. And so he writes this letter, um, as the church is being spread, as the church is going through a time of trial. Now, when we talk about the church, the ancient church, we have a tendency to think of the church always being, um, you know, Christians being thrown to the lions, that kind of thing. And that did occur, but that was not the, that was not what happened all the time. That was, it wasn't like that was what happened in the church every single day. Um, people were being thrown to lions. But rather, um, it did occur at times, and at the end of the the 3rd century, um, with the rise of some very anti-Christian elements in the Roman Roman world, uh, persecutions became more common. 
But for the most part, as long as Christians kept their heads down, didn't try to convert people, the the Roman world uh, pretty much let them ride. Now, the Jews in the first century really have some significant opposition to Christianity, and that opposition continues uh, well into the second century. But um, this is a this is a time period where Christianity is on the outside. It's it's marginalized. It's not a part of the Gentile world. It's not a part of the Jewish world. It it very much is its own world. Uh, they have a, a you know Christ is talking about this kingdom. He's talking about um, new loyalties to God and and. This is difficult for the Jewish establishment to handle, and so uh, they face opposition, although it's not open persecution all the time, there is significant opposition because Christianity is marginalized, and that marginalization is very similar to the status of Christianity today. The church is no longer at the center of society. Uh, Since about the middle of the 20th century, Uh, The church, and I use the lower C, Christianity lower C, um, not necessarily the biblical church, but the church in the sense of the Christian institution that dominated Western society, has been marginalized, and and we are a part of that marginalization. We've been moved to the outside. And evangelical Christianity largely has been in a process of backstepping, kind of um, dealing with culture and society coming at us and having to... Uh, back away, back away, back away. And we're reaching a point where that is um, not only impossible, because now we're being asked to violate Scripture, but we have no more room to move. And so we're being put under pressure, we're being put under trial. And so the book of James, the epistle of James, is appropriate for the time period that we find ourselves in. And I want to just read through the first 15 verses of the book of James and then talk a little bit about what James has to say to us and what the Holy Spirit uh, moved him, this brother of Jesus, to say. So James chapter 1 and verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Uh, In other words, the church that has been spread. Remember, this is a Jewish church at this point. Um, There's not a lot of Gentiles in it. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers fall and beauty perishes, so so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he stood, when he has stood test, uh, stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has pro- promised to those who love Him. Let no one say when he is tempted, "I am being tempted by God," for God cannot be tempted with evil, and He Himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it grow, is fully grown, brings forth death. Going all the way back to the beginning, James begins this, this epistle with the statement, count it all joy. Um, and, and the word that is being used there is to, um, it, it is this idea, not just of, um, oh, well, I, it's going to be joy, but rather that you choose, you make the choice to see trials as a joy, to see trials as an important component of your life, of your being, of your journey um, as a believer. Now, most people, when we think about uh, trials, when we think about um, the challenges of our Christian faith, we do not want to call it joy. Uh, we do not want to count it joy. We don't want to, we want to, um, instead, we see, we tend to see trials as a very negative thing. James wants to open us up, opens up right at the beginning with this this statement. Now, 
this this statement is meant to um it's meant to introduce what he's going his argument so we can't take this uh this one verse uh, verse two count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials for various kinds you can't just say okay we're just supposed to count all things for joy we have to actually understand what he's saying and and what he's saying is embedded in the rest of the passage so we need to get into uh, the rest of the passage what does he mean when we meet trials of various kinds now one of the things that James does is he is going to uh, repeat himself this is a very Hebrew thing to do and we miss a little bit of it in English as we as we go through count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness now the word trials and the word testing, those are the same word, one a noun and one a, a participle, but they're the same word. And so he introduces trials, and then he brings in um, testing or the trialing of your faith. Um, and then again, he brings up steadfastness. Faith produces steadfastness. He'll bring that back up in verse 12. Um, it'll, it'll come back up. Uh, he uses this statement right here when he says, um, it produces steadfastness, verse 4, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. Full effect and complete are the same word. Uh, and so he's continually, he's repeating himself, he's reiterating. And, and this is a very, very uh, Hebrew thing to do, and it's very possible that this may have originally been written in Hebrew. We don't, we don't know. We only have the Greek version, and it's, it's decent Greek. And so um, if it was, it was translated early, but it makes sense writing to a Jewish uh, Christianity, a Jewish church, that he would write in Hebrew or Aramaic, um, and he is conveying these ideas, and he's going to keep doubling up on these, uh, these ideas. And so as you read the text, you can see that and see what he's developing. But I want to, today I want to talk about um, what trials are. Uh, what does it mean when we go through a trial? Uh, so often our perception of trial is, like I said earlier, it's negative. We're we're thinking these are all the bad things that are happening me, to me. These are uh, all the negative things that are happening to me. And James has a very different perspective on that. He wants us to count them all joy, but then he unpacks why we should count them joy. It's not one. It's not just to say I'm just going to rejoice in the trials that I'm facing. What what does what does that mean? How do we count these things joy? Why should we count these things as joy? Now James is a um, is Joseph's son. And although he's a, a grown man at this point, um, he was not Joseph's oldest son, Jesus, who was not Joseph's biological son, but but his son in the sense that Joseph raised him. Jesus is the oldest. James is in the mix uh, of the sons of Mary and Joseph. But he would have uh, been very familiar with his father's work as a carpenter. And um, a carpenter, what does a carpenter use um, to fasten things together? Carpenters use nails, um, and, uh, and nails are made of metal, and metal is fashioned by a blacksmith. What does a carpenter use to fashion the wood? His chisels and his saws um, and his hammers and all of those things. Those are, those are metal things that are made by a blacksmith. And so James undoubtedly was familiar with the work of the, of the smith, with the blacksmith, and um, he takes these, um, this language of metallurgy, this language of, of the forge, this language of the blacksmith, and he's going to bring it into his discussion. When he talks about trials and testing, he is using a word that often describes the work of a blacksmith. Uh, and a blacksmith works different metal different ways. He, he applies his skill in different ways, uh, to craft specific tools. Um, I guarantee that no one watching this video has ever actually made a saw. Um, saws are very difficult to make. They, they have to be made out of a, 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 a steel that is um, flexible. It has to have side-to-side -side flexibility and let yet be rigid enough to convey force into the wood in such a way that it cuts it. It has to be, uh, you have to be able to sharpen it. Um, but it can't be so rigid that it snaps when it's put under pressure. There, there's some complicated things involved in making a handsaw. And a blacksmith makes a handsaw very different than he makes a chisel. Uh, a chisel has to be very rigid and, 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 and sturdy. And unlike a saw, it has to be thick. And, 
uh, it has to take an edge, uh, one edge, and it has to be able to chip away, and it, it's got to be much more, um, much more, uh, uh, um, uh, deal with a lot more force than a saw does. Uh, nails are made of a different metal. They have to have another function. They they can't swell. They can't, you know, there's, there's things that you have to do with them. Every th- piece of metal that's being forged has a different purpose and a different process and a different set of trials and testings it has to go through in order for you to know that this is a quality device. And and I imagine James, and I could be wrong, but I imagine James as a young man going with his father Joseph to the blacksmith to get a new saw or to get a new chisel. And the blacksmith describing uh, the different qualities that he has, the different kinds of metals that he has, what can Joseph afford, um, and and what's the trade-offs of, of pliability versus uh, versus durability versus sharpening, and, and what do you need to have. Everything is a little bit different. And, and so Joseph, James seems familiar with this. He seems familiar with this idea, and he throws out this idea of testing. And the testing is the forge. This is the, the, the forge of our faith. Uh, in verse 3, testing of your faith produces steadfastness. In other words, what God puts you through, the tests and trials that God puts you through, the purpose of those things is to build into you uh, reliability and strength and durability to so that you could be perfect and complete. Now, he doesn't mean perfect and complete like God is perfect, but rather perfect for the job that you have in front of you. I might have a phenomenal, uh, an absolutely phenomenal claw hammer, um, but that claw hammer is not the right tool for, uh, for cutting wood. Um, it, it, I might have a fantastic screwdriver, but that screwdriver is not great for driving nails. Um, different tools are used in different ways, and so they are tested and tried in different ways. Um, they are forged in different ways because they have different purposes. But everyone goes through the testing of our faith, and the testing of our faith produces steadfastness, and steadfastness, when it has come to full effect, we are equipped for the job that we are going to do. But so this testing, this forging of making us into the tools that God wants us to be, uh, James kind of gets into the nitty-gritty of the process of these trials. What what do trials accomplish? What why should we take joy because of what they accomplish in us? And let's talk about what they accomplish. In verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and let it be given him. If you are lacking, and here's this word lacking, he's picking it up from verse 4, if you are lacking in wisdom, which is part of steadfastness, all right, that is because as you are going through the test, all right, as you are going enduring this test and, and this process, um, God is going to uh, reveal our hidden weaknesses. One of the reasons that a blacksmith works um, on a piece of metal that he's going to be turning into a tool is he has to be able to see if there are any weaknesses. Are there, are there some places that maybe air pockets got in or, or the, the metals weren't mixed properly? And so maybe there's a, a, an odd hard part in the, in the piece at some point that's going to make it brittle and it's going to break or, or the, the, the temper is not quite right. There are hidden weaknesses that trials um, reveal so that the, the blacksmith can, can fix them. He can, um, he can correct them. He can reforge if necessary. He can uh, reinforce if necessary. And trials illuminate for us the things that we are lacking, our hidden weaknesses. Um, and he talks about, look, if you, don't, if you don't do that, if you don't see those hidden weaknesses, if you don't endure that process, if you don't let the weaknesses become manifest, then you're going to result in a double-minded man. You're going to be unstable in all your ways. Again, think of this forging process and imagine a flaw in a in a in a saw that you're using to cut wood. Um, a, a tiny weakness or 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 aberration in the mix in the in the mold, the way that the saw was made. And as you're trying to cut something, it it catches and it snaps in the middle and gets stuck. Um, that's a that's a dangerous situation. So the blacksmith has to make sure that those flaws 
um, those those areas of um, of weakness are exposed and treated. Um, verse nine, he says. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Uh, that's both the lowly brother and the rich person, not just the rich person. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers fall, and its beauty perishes. So also will a rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now, we could talk all the time about rich and poor, but the, but the point that I wanna want you to see in this is that James is describing things being turned upside down, your, your world and your values being turned upside down. And if you think about this Jewish church that's being spread out of Jerusalem, uh, they have to abandon their homes, they have to abandon their wealth, they probably have to leave behind some of their family uh, because they're being scattered by persecution. Um, they lose their places in the synagogue. And yet other Christians, uh, other Jewish Christians, who might, maybe they own all the camels that they use in the caravan to go to Antioch of Syria, or, or, or maybe they're, they're, they have some business interests in towns that are away from Jerusalem, and they're able to support, and suddenly they become the rich. You know, the poor become the rich, the rich become the poor. Um, the world gets turned upside down in our trials. Sometimes our trials, our, our trials reveal hidden weaknesses, um, but then God also has to flip us upside down and look at us from every direction. And trial is about being uh, exposed in all different directions so that our all of our weaknesses can be exposed. All of our weaknesses can be uh, examined. Uh, I, I remember a story about Steve Jobs, the, the founder of Apple, one of the two founders of Apple. And Jobs was watching his father paint a, a, a fence and his father was painting the fence. He was painting both sides of the fence. And the, the back side of the fence, it, it was just up against trees and stuff. And, and, uh, and young Steve, he said to his father, um, his adopted father, he said, uh, why are you painting the part that nobody can see? Um, and nobody will know that it's not painted. And his father said, I'll know. And Steve Jobs took that, that to heart. And so uh, one of the things that they did in Apple at Apple was not only make the outside of their devices um, a appealing, aesthetically appealing, but inside their devices are often organized in a very symmetrical, neat way, um, because he believed that it was just as important what the outside, uh, what the inside looked like, as the outside, even though no one would ever see it. Um, there, there was a, a value of every aspect of this project, every aspect of this work has to be examined and thought through. And there were things that Jobs would do to his engineers. He would, his artists would come back, his creatives would come back and say, this is what we want this to look like. And the engineers would say, it's not possible to make it look like that. And Jobs would say, it needs to be possible. Find a way. Um, because it was important that every aspect of it be examined and be beautiful. And our trials take the various parts of us um, at all different angles, God is looking for all the, the flaws and weaknesses in us, um, in every side, every part of us exposed. And then finally, in verse 12, uh, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So he's, he's saying, you get through this, you're going to be, you're going to, this is an accomplishment. But then in verse 13, he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by, with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings death. Uh, and this third aspect of trial is that trials will push us um, through all of the blame, all of the uh, this is because of this, this is so-and-so's fault, and get us even to the point of blaming God for the, the difficulties we face, and, and we human beings do this, it pushes us through all of that. Trials force us to go through the uncomfortable reality of who we are in our hearts, and our tendency as human beings to blame everybody but ourselves until we finally get to the bottom of who we are until the rubber hits the road and we say, okay, this is the reality of who I am, um, and then I make a choice, right? Then I make a choice. Do I choose to persevere and be steadfast, 
or do I give up and run away? Um, and the difference, right, the difference between a temptation and a trial. Uh, trials are God purifying our faith, making us steadfast so we can be used um, in whatever purpose he has appointed us as his tools to be used. Uh, but when we give up, when we surrender, we say, that's it, this trial is too much, I can't take it anymore. Well, then we enter the era of temptation, which is that our desires, our personal desires, uh, motivate our actions, and they push us through. So the difference between temptation and trial, a trial is God um, putting me through something to make me who I need to be, to accomplish whatever it is he's called me to do. A temptation is me giving in to my desires that are at odds with the priorities of God, but they are uh, whatever I, I like. And along the process of choosing between finding joy in the trials that God is putting us in, because it is, it is, uh, it, it's revealing our weaknesses so they can be healed, it's, it's turning our world upside down so all of us is prepared so that we are strong throughout, we have strength in every aspect, it, it's pushing us beyond this, this mentality of blaming everybody else and accepting the reality of who we are and what we're called to be. Excuse me. And when, when God is pushing to the, us to that, um, when he's driving us through that, uh, we are, again, we're confronted. Do we, we follow God and live in our faith all right, and endure, and, and not just endure and put up with, but count it joy as we are tried, uh, or do we give in to our own desires and temptations and follow our own priorities and get lost in the mix? See, trial, and 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 this is where I want to end, trials um, are, are are things that are difficult. We feel the fire. We feel the folding. We feel the tempering. We And we scream at God um, as he is doing what he is doing. But if we don't go through the trials, if we don't endure... The, the process of God being at work in us, if we don't endure it, then we will not be prepared for the task that he set us in front of us and set in front of us. Sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, well, this trial was just too much and, and I just gave up. It wasn't worth it, you know, and they gave up on, on it. And then they say, I don't understand why God doesn't do anything in my life. Well, God won't do anything in your life if you're not being forged to be the tool if you're not if you're not enduring encountering it joy as God tests and tries us to make us who we're supposed to be if you break while that's happening then you're never going to fulfill your purpose you're never going to get to the point of being the tool in the hands of God that you are supposed to be and so of course you don't feel fulfilled of course you feel like God's not doing anything in your life it's because you're you're not at the point of being able to be used a raw piece of metal that has not been forged is not a pair of scissors. You can't use it to cut paper. The scissors have to be forged and tried and sharpened and tempered. And, and that process is necessary for you to accomplish the task that you have been given. Don't go through the trial. Don't be surprised that you don't have fulfillment in life. Um, now, I, I want to just wrap this up in talking about the church. Everyone in the church goes through trials. And the church should be a place where those who have gone through trials and those who have suffered and those who have failed and those who have screamed and yet they've endured and, and their weaknesses have been reinforced, our place is then to minister to those that are going through trials. Sometimes we, we have so many things we don't want to talk about. You know, like, like take, for example, you know, a failed marriage. A, a, a Christian's, you know, a, a marriage falls apart and marriages fall apart all the time. Um, but a marriage falls apart and, and then God restores you and maybe, you know, he gives you uh, another, uh, you know, a, a, another chance and, and you're able to, to, uh, to see how that trial has, um, even in your failure, okay, um, even in your failure, even in, in whatever it was, uh, you are now better equipped to care for those who are now going through the same problem. Uh, people who are facing similar challenges. Now you're you're able to be um, a tool in the hand of God to minister their lives, or or somebody that struggled with finding purpose, or or struggled with um, you know anxiety or whatever. And and God has taken you through that trial. Uh, then He has equipped you to be able to help others as they go through that trial. And and that is that's what the church is called to be under pressure when the church is going through trials. 
we we go through them together. We endure them together. And if we see it that way, if we if we journey that way, it transforms our attitude about what God is doing. And we truly can count it as joy because everything that we're going through, God is using for his praise and his glory. He is using our failures um, because when we our weaknesses are exposed, he can strengthen and reinforce that area. He is turning us upside down, and, and yeah, that's uncomfortable and it hurts, but it's so that he can see every aspect of who we are and can mend us at every level. And yeah, he takes us through this difficulty of screaming and, and the pain and even blaming him. And when we come through the other side, we are transformed into the men and women that he wants us to be, uh, to serve his purposes on earth. So I hope if you're going through a trial uh, this week, I hope that you will be encouraged to count this as joy. Yeah, it's hard. It's supposed to be hard. Trials are hard. Uh, Those things that we endure that are hard, they make us better. I mean, imagine going to a a, a personal trainer and after you do five push-ups going, ah, you're so mean. You're going to kill me. You're going to hurt me. I don't want to do any more. Only let me do what I want to do. No, if you're going to a personal trainer, it's to become better than what you are. That means you've got to push. You've got to hurt. You've got to be in pain. And God working in your life, um, the trials that he's putting you through are for so much greater purposes than our physical fitness. So count it joy, even in the pain, even in the difficulty, even in the struggles, even in the areas where we don't necessarily understand what's going on. It is a joy that because God is at work in you to build steadfastness so that you become the perfect tool in his hand for the calling and ministry he has for you.